In this topic, we're going to discuss homeostasis and excretion. So, by the end of this topic, you'll understand why we need excretory systems, what homeostasis is, why we need homeostasis, what a negative feedback loop is, and what deamination and excretion are. So, what do animal cells do to stay alive? We know that animal cells move material across the cell membrane by diffusion. So they get nutrients in and oxygen in. Respiration occurs and then you've got waste products. How do these waste products move out? Well, you've got carbon dioxide and urea. And these are removed by respiratory and excretory systems. So what is the difference between unicellular and multicellular? Unicellular cells are in direct contact with the environment. This means that the cells can easily get nutrients in and waste out by diffusion. Multicellular organisms, on the other hand, are not in direct contact with the environment, the internal cells, that is. So the internal cells can't get nutrients in and waste out easily, so they need organ systems. Most animal and plants are complex organisms made up of millions of cells. Different parts of the organism perform different functions. Information is transferred between these different parts and helps to regulate the levels of substance in the organism. Multicellular animals have had to evolve organ systems, which you can see here. So, animals have evolved organ systems for getting materials in, moving them around, for example, your digestive system, respiratory system, and circulatory system, and then removing wastes, for example, your respiratory system and excretory system. Now, what is homeostasis? Homeostasis is the maintenance of a stable internal environment in the cells, in the tissue fluid surrounding the cells, and in the blood plasma. It involves maintaining the chemical makeup, volume, and other features of blood and tissue fluid within narrow limits. These are called the normal ranges. Homeostasis means that the cells in the body are an environment that meets their needs and allows them to function normally despite external changes. So any changes that do occur will be readjusted for so that they return to the set point. So what examples of homeostasis? You've got temperature, water, and glucose. So if you look at temperature, you know that a low temperature will slow the metabolic reaction, and a high temperature will do what? It's going to denature the proteins and enzymes. Water. If you take a cell and you put it into a very concentrated solution, what's going to happen to that cell? Well, the water is going to move from a high water potential in the cell out of the cell by osmosis. If you take that cell and you put it into dilute solution, for example, pure water, water is going to move into the cell and eventually the cell is going to burst. So you don't want that happening. Then glucose, a low concentration of glucose, will decrease the rate of respiration, whilst a high concentration of glucose will cause water to be removed from the cell by osmosis. So how do we control homeostasis? Well, if you control the composition of the blood, which therefore controls the composition of the tissue fluid, you'll be able to control what's going on in the cell. So what are different control mechanisms? You've got a negative feedback loop, which turns the system off. And most control mechanisms in living organisms use a negative feedback loop. Then you've got a positive feedback loop. So any deviation from a set point causes changes that result in even greater deviation from the normal. For example, this occurs in neurons with the sodium-potassium pump, and then also oxytocin during labor. So an increase in oxytocin causes labor contractions, which causes an increase in oxytocin, which causes increase in labor contractions in, until the baby's born. So what is a negative feedback loop? Well, you've got the receptor and the effector. The receptor receives a signal, so it receives an input about the parameters. Then it sends 
a signal to the effector which causes a change so that the parameters return back to normal. So if the parameter is too high, the effector will cause a change so that the parameter is decreased. If the parameter falls too low, the effector causes a change so that the parameter is increased. So it's kind of like a figure of 8. So if you look at an example of temperature, the hypothalamus will detect a change in temperature. So if the temperature is too high, what's going to happen in the capillaries and sweat glands? The capillaries are going to dilate and the sweat glands are going to sweat. So this will bring the temperature back down. Now, if the hypothalamus detects a change in the temperature so that the temperature is too low, the capillaries are going to constrict and the muscles are going to shiver. So the temperature will be re increased again or increased again. So what is excretion? What is excretion? Excretion, excretion is, the is the removal of waste, of waste substances from, metas, from metabolic reactions. For example, you have carbon dioxide being produced by respiration and urea being produced by the deamination of excess amino acids. Did you know that humans produce about 500 decimeters cubed of carbon dioxide and 400 cubic centimeters of water from respiration? Now if you look here, proteins and nucleic acids get broken down and eventually the amino group is removed. This amino group can form a waste product, for example, ammonia, urea or uric acid. Notice how the different organisms produce different waste products of nitrogen waste. So let's look at ammonia first. Ammonia is the easiest product to form when the amino group is removed. It does not require ATP and it's soluble in water. However, ammonia is very poisonous, so only organisms such as freshwater fish, which have access to large volumes of water, use ammonia as a waste product. Urea, on the other hand, is moderately toxic, but it's about 400 times less toxic than ammonia. So it can be stored temporarily and it's fairly soluble, but it does require ATP to be formed. So it's the excretory product of organisms that have some access to water. For example, mammals, most amphibians, sharks, and some bony fish. Uric acid, on the other hand, is insoluble. It cannot diffuse into cells, so it's not poisonous. But it does take a large amount of ATP to be produced. It's found in animals that um, live in very dry areas where there's not much water because almost no water is needed for its removal. It's also low in mass, so birds that fly use it as their waste product. And then also birds lay eggs, birds and reptiles lay eggs, and the animal within that egg cannot get rid of waste products, so at least uric acid is not poisonous. Whilst ammonia and urea are poisonous and that would accumulate so the little animal inside that egg would die. Now what is deamination? Well if you look here, this is the typical structure of an amino acid. You've got the blue part, which is the amino group, and the green part, which is the carboxylic group. So what happens during deamination? Well during deamination, the amino group is removed. So you have the amino group being removed, and what's going to happen to the rest? Well, this is going to form a keto acid. This keto acid is used in aerobic respiration, or it can be converted to glucose and fat. The amino group combines with hydrogen to form ammonia. The ammonia combines with carbon dioxide to form urea, which moves to the kidneys and is excreted in urine. So if you look here a little bit more closely of what deamination involves, deamination occurs in the liver. So you have the amino acid is broken down. It forms a keto acid and ammonia. The ammonia combines with carbon dioxide to form urea. And remember that the formation of urea requires ATP. This urea moves in the blood to the kidneys where it's excreted as urine or in the urine. Now I'm sure you've come across creatine. So the waste product of creatine is creatinine. Creatine is made in the liver 
and it's used as creatine phosphate in muscles, where it's an energy store. Some of the creatine is converted to creatinine, which is excreted. Uric acid is formed from nucleic acids and is also excreted in the kidneys. So, what have we learned today? So, what have you learned in well, this lesson? Homeostasis, well, homeostasis is the maintenance, is maintenance of, a, of a stable, stable internal, internal environment, environment in, cells, in cells, the tissue fluid that tissue surrounds fluid the cells, and the and blood, blood plasma, plasma from which the what tissue is excretion? fluid is derived. Excretion is the removal excretion of waste substances, from, of metabolic waste substances processes. from metabolic processes. And then how... So what, what happens, happens to proteins, have proteins in the liver? Proteins, proteins are broken are down into, broken amino, down into acids. amino acids. These and amino acids are de deaminated in, in the liver. So the amino group, so the amino forms group ammonia, is you, which combines, combines with hydrogen carbon dioxide, to form ammonia, uses ATP and the ammonia to form urea. combines with carbon dioxide, the carboxylic group using is ATP used to, make to form urea, which is um, excreted by the kidneys. Keto acid. The rest of it, the rest of the group, for example, the carboxylic group is used in aerobic respiration or it's converted to glucose and fat. And that concludes our lesson. The end.